Hello, my name is Robert Walker, Accountant and Insolvency Practitioner. Uh, this is the tenth in my series on Managing Insolvency in Troubled Times. The title of this particular session is The Matter of Who the Credit Is and What Classes Do They Belong To. If you recall, when we did consider the initiation of compromise, the obligation on the proponent was to send documents to knowing creditors are going to be affected by the compromise. They'd also mentioned that those people may well be in classes. Now, I think that classes has been an inhibition on the practice of compromise uh, for about a century and it's time that its mystique was dispelled because I think it's a simpler matter than might first appear and I draw a great deal of comfort from the Bank of Tokyo Solid Energy case in that respect as you'll see. Now, who is a creditor? Well, a creditor is a defined term in Section 227 of the Act, and it, as you can see, has two types of creditor mentioned, those who are subject to Section 303, which is part of the liquidation um, part of the Companies Act, and secured creditors. So I can really tell you who the unsecured creditors are, but that is defined in Section 303, and as you can see there, it is a liability that is present or future, certain or contingent, whether it's ascertained or it's a liability for damages. So those are quite complex ideas and they cover a whole panoply of possibilities. Let's start with the simple case. Now the simple case are simple contracts of supply, whether that be of goods, services, labour, being employment contracts, or indeed money from a bank that's also subject to a contract and by interpreting the contract, you know how much money is owed at any given time. Now, one of the problems with contracts of supply is that they can be, there can be disputes. I don't have any particular advice with respect to that, except just to say, sort it. Getting into disputes and having them run forever is almost certainly going to destabilise any compromise and end in the result that everybody wants to avoid. Now, I'll deal with two special cases in a minute, but I want to just make a special mention that not all con uh, creditors emerge from contracts, they also come from statute. I'm thinking of taxes, and there can be regulation, meaning rates for local authorities or levies for various bodies. The reason for mentioning that is just to make sure they're not omitted, but also to identify that certain classes, certain people within that, that um, collection of creditors have a preference on liquidation, meaning they are unsecured, but they outrank other creditors who are also unsecured. And we'll think about the effect of that later on when I discuss classes. Now, the special cases are contingent and future liabilities on the one hand and secured liabilities on the other. Now, contingent liabilities come from complex contracts. Now, the sorts of things I'm thinking of are warranties, for example. There are plenty of businesses that um, promise to stand behind the product they sell or the service they deliver and will make good. So if there's a large number of customers, somewhere amongst that pool of customers there will be people who have got a right to have a repair. They happen to be creditors. It's just that the person who is the supplier, the, the company, doesn't know who they are. Now, don't make the mistake of thinking that it's only if there's a clear-cut contract um, coming out with a warranty attached to it. There might also be by operation of the Consumer Guarantees Act. The key characteristic of those people is they exist, or they might exist, but you don't know who they are. Those are the people who are unknown. The Bank of Tokyo dealt with that in a rather strange way because there were people who were, who were known to be creditors, but they were not going to be brought into the scope of the compromise, in which case they were excluded, they were not affected. They were known but not affected. In the case of warranties, they're unknown and therefore cannot be affected. The same thing applies, their rights are not disturbed. Now, future liabilities, what might that be? Well, I think an example was a lease. Now, if you sit there and think about being a retailer, for example, you want to take out a reasonably long-term right of occupation of the premises you're going to conduct your business from for two reasons. One, you want to have some certainty about the 
rent you're going to pay, but you also don't want to develop intellectual property, i.e. your brand name and the, and the high street, and then find that you lose it because the landlord evicts you. So that's a good reason for having longer term leases. The problem with it, of course, is that if you're in financial difficulties, there's a runoff. The lease carries on, and you owe it. So those are future liabilities. Now, what I think is probably the answer to it is that you take the landlord, you've got to work out what the landlord is going to be as a creditor. They will be rent arrears, and they will be, in my mind, the difference between the contract value of the rent and the market value of the rent, which will then be discounted back, in other words, adjusted by the time value of money. And I think that is the value of the creditor, and that explains what a future liability might be. Now, there are other uh, contracts that are future in orientation. I'm thinking of um, Ford Exchange contracts. Um, the, at any one time, given inter uh, exchange rates, if they've gone against you, will create a liability at that time. They may well need to be taken into account, or they remain unaffected. That is a matter to be discussed with the person on the other side of the contract. Now, I just hope there's no more complex financial instruments, but the same thing would apply in small to medium sized enterprises if they've got them. Anyway, now, just a brief word about secured creditors. I've talked about them before when we talked about receivership. Now, as I said then, secure creditors are people with a prior right to some or all of the assets of a company. Those people, to the extent that the assets are equal or greater than their liabilities right, due to them, are um, in a class of their own because they've got an absolute right, irrespective of the compromise, to come and take their assets away. So they need to be reckoned with. There is a bit of an issue if there is a uh, the liability is greater than the value of the assets, which might almost certainly happen upon liquidation, but that creates a complexity. Now, to those people who are quite naive, they might sit there and say to themselves, if a person owns or has a right to all of the assets, why aren't they a director? Because they are in control of the assets, well, a complex question, and I might deal with that at a later date. But it might certainly be a factor that should be raised in by a proponent, or it could be, to uh, take up with uh, people who are secured, particularly if they control the whole business. Now, um, I'm saying that I consider those people to be in class of their own, in other words, they have a power of veto over the compromise. Well, where do they compromise their rights is quite another matter. So that brings me to the notion of the general class, where everybody else does. Now, this is a matter that was dealt with in about 1892, I think it is, in a case called Sovereign Life Assurance and Dodd. And what happened is that Dodd had a down policy with Sovereign. He'd also borrowed money from Sovereign. The policy matured and he was entitled to his payout as you get with an endowment policy. But before he got it, Sovereign collapsed. The liquidator, because it was only the liquidator who could do it, arranged a compromise. He put Dodd into the class of um, policyholders, being mainly all those people whose policies hadn't matured. And um, the compromise was arranged in such a way that his amount to be paid to him was reduced and his, the debt that he had, um, he wasn't allowed to set off against um, what he was owed. Dodd thought that was incredibly unfair and he appealed it. And the judiciary said, well, he's right, he should have been on a class of his own. And that was the way things stood for a century or more. And people thought it was very difficult to work out classes because they seemed to be innumerable. Then there was another compromise with respect to another insurer. It wasn't similar, but it was another insurer. And the judge at the first instance was confused and didn't know how to deal with it. 
So it went to the Court of Appeal in England, and that, that English Court of Appeal said everybody's misunderstood Sovereign and Dot all these years. It wasn't that his the difference attributable to him being in a different class wasn't that his policy had matured compared to the others whose policies hadn't matured, it was to do with the set-off. Now that's a very unique set of circumstances. It shouldn't be allowed to dictate classes of creditors for now. Now, so then that leaves me with how would you solve that particular problem? What is the criterion by which you would judge who is in what class? Well, fortunately, the problem is national fat was addressed somewhat elliptically, but was addressed in the Bank of Tokyo and Solid Energy. And Justice Winkleman suggested that the appropriate measure to consider people in terms of a class of compromise for compromise is what would happen to them in liquidation. What is the counterfactual, in other words? If their rights and interests end up being the same, even though they appear to be different amongst themselves, then they're in the same class. So the best example of that is the preference I talked about before attributable to some taxes. And the question would be, what does happen? Does the preference get on it? Well, the preference is more apparent than real. As liquidation is an expensive process, the assets are generally scooped up by people who are secured creditors, um, the assets evaporate, such as the goodwill of the business and some of the debtors do as it happens, and then um, the legal rights available that used to be pursued frequently, such as avoidable uh, preference, are not because of the, the avoidable preference has been emasculated. In other words, preferred creditors will, are in basically the same boat in most liquidations. So the counterfactual would cause the preferred creditors to be put into the same class as every other unsecured creditor. It might be advisable to discuss that with the preferred creditors who are almost certainly going to be the Crown and the employees, but I don't think you will find they have a particular objection. The key to the whole thing is that simplicity must prevail, and that is perhaps the main message that comes out of the Bank of Tokyo case. That is what Justice Winkleman described in the history, make it simple, and if you add to that honesty and transparency, I think you can't go wrong. Please, if you wish for written material, um, look below the video and you will find uh, ways to acquire it. Thank you very much. Bye.